Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Dan Neely. Wow, it's kind of bright out here. That was not a very energetic clap. That's a clap for you guys. It's lots of energy. Um, so we're going to have a very cool panel. I'm very, uh, very excited um, to speak with these guys. So uh, before we get there, so there's roughly f uh, five billion dollars going to be spent in social advertising, um, and as we think about that number, that's quite the uh, quite the spenders game, right? Spenders game, right? Yeah. For any of you here this morning, you get the joke. Those of you who are not, maybe it wasn't a joke and it wasn't funny. Um, so. With that, um, I'm going to introduce, um, introduce our panelists. Um, we have four individuals here today that represent some of the, uh, some of the great thought leadership in this space. So first of all, uh, first up um, is uh, Deerage. Deerage is with Facebook. He runs uh, performance solutions uh, for Facebook. Um, this is the guy that can help us think about how do we make this stuff work and how do we make it prove itself and prove its worth. So uh, first, uh, let's invite Deerage up to the uh, up to the stage. <clears throat> so next up, we have Greg. Uh, Greg is uh, is from Hootsuite, and you know his perspective is is is, is quite an interesting one. Um, granted, he runs business development, but his perspective is quite broad. He's able to share with us. You know, not just investments in one platform, but investments in many platforms. Um, he also wears some pretty cool socks as well. So let's invite uh, Greg up to the uh, up to the stage. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks so much. Okay, so next up, uh, so we have a pl we have one a single platform. We have a platform that looks across um, social. Um, so next up, uh, we're going to bring Radina to the stage. Radina invests in the space. Um, she's a, a venture capitalist, and so certainly, you know, where there is money, um, we like to get the uh, the perspective and point of view. Um, and so she is super smart on the space. She has a number of investments in the space. And so certainly it's a perspective where, as we think about the early and leading indicators, um, if we think back to what we talked about this morning um, about knowledge um, and how that can help us reduce the amount of chaos in the future. So let's invite uh, Regina to the stage. Hi. Are you going to present all of that? Nope. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. And last but not least, uh, we have Jeff. Uh, Jeff is going to join us. Uh, he's uh, from Wildfire. Uh, he's responsible for the ad solutions over at uh, Wildfire. And he's going to bring us pers a perspective that, again, allows us to think across hey, an entire spectrum, but also he exists inside one company, um, that being Google. So he has you know, kind of two masters, if you will. Um, so he'll have an interesting perspective for us as well. So Jeff, why don't you come to the stage? Okay. Hey, how are you? Good. Okay. How many of you in the room are familiar with, with, uh, with a TV show called The McLaughlin Group? <laughs> few of you. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like John McLaughlin is the reason why I asked the question. And for those of you that don't know John McLaughlin, I would go and, uh, go and look it up. Um, so before we get started, um, if you have questions, um, I have my phone with me. I'm not going to be rude. I'm not looking at my phone because I'm taking phone calls or checking my Twitter stock. Um, I'm doing it because um, I'm going to get questions. So I'm going to get questions sent to me. So use the hashtag, uh, AdTechNY. You can also use Ender's Game if you want to. Um, and we'll take questions from the audience and certainly ask our illustrious uh, panelists here um, what's going on. So um, I chatted with each of you uh, before we uh, decided to do this panel. Um, we recorded all those conversations. <laughs> And in recording those conversations, we then took that information, we took that data, and we ran it through, uh, through one of our technologies to figure out what you guys wanted to talk about. And so the results should appear on the screen here in a second as far as what you wanted to talk about. So social investments, grumpy cats, <laughs> Google Wildfire, Hootsuite, and Facebook. So it turned out you guys wanted to talk about yourselves. So we decided that that was maybe not what we wanted to do today. So instead, we said, OK, let's take a look at the audience and what these guys have been engaging on over the last couple of weeks, and what do they want to talk about. 
And so that's what we ended up uh, pulling out. So we were able, so data-driven marketing, we're looking at the, the org structure, ROI, et cetera. So I'm going to jump in uh, with the first question. So it's, it's somewhat the elephant in the room. Um, and the elephant in the room is there's roughly $100 billion in just marketing spent in the US. 22% of consumers think about social as driving some form of purchase. They trust someone else's opinion, and that's why they drive, uh, they do that. 54% of CMOs um, can't prove the ROI of social. They're struggling with it. Um, they don't know what to do with it. They're being tasked by their bosses um, to basically say, how do I do more with less? So I'd love a perspective. Um, Dearidge, you're at Facebook. You're responsible for performance solutions. Um, these two things, they're kind of polar opposites. Consumers saying, hey, we love it. It's driving to purchase. CMO saying, I can't prove it, it that it's happening. Where do we sit and how do we, how do we solve some of this stuff? Yeah, I, mean, I think um, listen, that's, that's a great question. And I think one thing to recognize is that uh, most CMOs, uh, in the end, care for uh, the objectives they have. And that's why they're asking the question. I mean, they want to drive sales. Uh, they want to increase penetration of their mobile apps. They want to drive foot traffic. They want to build a brand. Uh, those things are what they are focused on. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a fair question, I think, uh, as these new platforms are emerging, um, to, it takes some time to f people to figure out, you know, is it really del delivering value? Um, I think from where we sit, um, we really have been, especially in the last 24 months, have been really focused on driving those objectives. And there is a whole body of evidence that we're delivering on ROI. Um, uh, so, how, how does uh, the CMO get their hand on that stuff? Because they're, they're not, they're not, you guys are proving it, you guys are doing it. Right. They're not seeing it or able to prove to their bosses. Well, I mean, I think uh, most CMOs that we talk to actually are seeing the ROI. Um, so let me take a couple examples. For example, uh, working in, with the, 50, the other 46%, is that what you're the, the, Well, we have a million that advertisers. <laughs> that would be, though. We, we have a million advertisers who are, you know, uh, from the, the guy, the local photographer, to the, the, the biggest brand. And, and, you know, they're not going to keep spending money every month if they're not seeing ROI. I think there is a little bit of a, a miss out there that that social doesn't work. But part of the problem is that we... There's a lot of noise around social metrics and you know, um, you know, fans and um, when. Uh, but if you really talk to the folks, talk to we, the folks we're talking to, uh, we are really trying to deliver online sales. Um, we are delivering mobile app installs. You know, the best uh, platform for driving installs. So I think it's a fair question. But I think in our conversations, we're seeing time and time again we're delivering our rights. So I, I I don't think there's any doubt at this stage that. Uh, social delivers value. The problem sometimes happens where we do do not um, focus on the objectives that the marketers have, right. and and I think that's probably where the um, the you know some of these comments might have come from. So, Greg, Greg, you you look across platforms, so you're able to think about many platforms working together, and arguably it's not about the social metric; it's about does it drive revenue, and so how we think about a revenue number, not thinking about hey, I got more of more likes, more tweets, more, whatever it might be. Um, it's about how much more revenue did I get, or did I do it for a lower cost? Those, right. those are the two things that we can drive in a, an income statement that ultimately result in a net positive. Right. So, how do you, so how do you, what do you think about this? So, the number you shared, $5 billion in social advertising spend this year, uh, and is an interesting one because you know it's about 117, I think, is the number that eMarketer published recently uh, that we're spending on adver digital advertising globally, like around the world. So um, when I think about that pie of digital advertising, a lot of it is direct response. So the immediate opportunity that Deerage is seeing and working with is being able to go, hey, you're using other properties to drive people to business objectives. Mm -hmm. um, we can do that on, on Facebook. And the people you're talking to are seeing that. I think the fact that there's a lot of CMOs that aren't aware of this mm -hmm. shows the growth opportunity for this and that social has this opportunity to right now grow the digital uh, direct response pie. But even beyond that, it's like $550 billion in, t in advertising is spent every year. And if you start thinking about the return on investment, there's really three reasons why people use social platforms in, in general when you're a marketer. There's three things. You're going to drive direct response to an action, to a website. There's 
the ability to build a bigger reach, so more fans, followers. And the last one is to get more exposure for your message. And those last two more closely aligned with that branding spend that's more closely aligned with, with, with television and radio than the current kind of status of, of online marketing. So that's kind of... But, but CMOs, they don't, they're not... Bud the way that they, in which they budget, right? Yeah. So if you think about it, so if, the, if we break them into the, part of the pie into direct marketing and brand marketing, you know, so let's say there's $100 billion spent in each and there's $20 billion in direct marketing that goes into digital. So if the, but the CMO, most CMOs of the major spenders in the world care about brand advertising. Right. They don't care about the direct piece of the business. Someone else in the business does. And so if the CMO is being tasked with, how do I think about this in context of my budget, what do I do? Right. And so, Rudina, what I would ask you is, how do we think about the way in which they're budgeting for social, the way they should be thinking about social, or, and what's ultimately driving them, um, because they're, they're struggling with it, right? As, as a CMO, they look at it and they're like, hey, I care about, I care about brand advertising. Correct. And to pick on where um, Greg left off, I think CMOs are changing their profiles and the way that they approach marketing. We have the advent of what I'd call the chief marketing technologist, where software um, is taking money away or is eating, I'll say, the both direct um, budgets but also brand building budgets. Mm -hmm. So we have the um, penetration of software, and that's one approach. In terms of the ROI question, fundamentally, I think C um, CMOs are asking the folks who are pitching them to tell them exactly what the ROI is. And, uh, you know, as a venture capitalist, I look at what the CMOs will be expecting two, three, four years from now, and honestly, um, companies will have to make the case for how they're driving sales lift highly measurable because you know it's not just enough to have the right audience it's not just enough to build brand with folks let's say with women of my age that you know you have a strong following you're an xyz brand it's enough it's important to have their attention and their relevance and intention big data was one of the themes that you uh, you touched on so while today cmos are trying to get their arms around roi yesterday they were trying to get their arms around engagement tomorrow they're going have to know that individual consumer at, with multiple data, with multiple levels of information, and drive a sale through that. And honestly, they have started. If you pitch a CMO, and we all know that, well, I know that for my companies, I mean, think of social flow, and when they go in, first page, they make the ROI case. Yeah. They make the ROI case with the CMO. They're getting smarter by the day. Yeah, I, I, I think, so I somewhat agree with you, somewhat disagree with you in that. Wrong. Yeah. You told me to say that. <laughs> That's from John McLaughlin. When John McLaughlin thought someone was wrong, you go, wrong. <laughs> um, anyway, so if you think about it, so, but, so CMOs are still very much thinking about the purchase funnel, right? They think right. about how we think about awareness to consideration to ultimately transacting. They're not going to go and focus solely on transacting, right? right. They're going to focus all the, way through the por all the way through the portfolio. So when you're, a, you know, when you're a platform like Facebook, right, you're thinking about, okay, I've got, the, I've got this perspective on how do I think about it all the way through? How do you prove to me that it works? Um, so, Jeff, I'd love to hear, like, some examples of, like, you know, how do, how do you prove that it works? How do we go beyond, hey, here's a bunch of interesting social metrics, social right. reach stuff, and how do we actually say, you know, this fundamentally works? Yeah, absolutely. I think the question of does social media work is probably an old question. It's more how now, and how do we prove that it's working and show through technology? And there's sort of, I think, a, a multi-piece answer here, but what, what we do inside of, of Wildfire and, and DoubleClick is really try and expose how this is working and through technology actually leverage things like Facebook advertising, Twitter advertising, alongside of the bigger picture, the bigger digital picture. So Jeff, Jeff I, I, I have to interrupt you. I, um, I'm sure we would love to hear what you guys do, but I'd love to hear examples. Yeah, so I think a good example here is with Kodak specifically, they actually ran a campaign thinking about that bigger picture and thinking about how do we leverage social advertising as a piece of our digital strategy. Not optimizing a page post ad or a Twitter post, but actually thinking about this holistically and seeing how it works together. And what they did was actually they ran a Facebook campaign 
uh, the goal was actually to get sort of awareness about their photo kiosks that are in uh, Walgreens and other stores. Uh, basically what we were doing was we were leveraging sort of Facebook's DR advertising when it comes to conversion pixels and custom audiences and using the open graph and action spec targeting and looking at engagements that are happening not on Facebook but elsewhere in the world and using that to actually target our Facebook ads. But further to that, we were using display advertising, search advertising, all sort of pointed at this same thing and every piece of this puzzle was actually pixeled and we were able to see how each piece actually played in the funnel. And what this is doing is technology is finally allowing us to actually step away from those social metrics and look beyond it, the fan and engagement and PTAT and whatever that might be and actually get down to that ROI number and see where is it playing in the funnel. And that was just a great example, I think, of actually looking at that holistic digital strategy mm. and using the different pieces of the puzzle and then l allowing technology to actually expose sort of behind the Emerald Curtain that piece that has been, we know it's working, we feel it's working, but now we can see not how does it perform against search or against display, but with those pieces. How are they all working together to make an effective campaign? So I think that's a... Uh, go ahead. I mean, that's, a, that's where this, that sentiment is coming more so from anything else. I think today, a marketer, if you look at, you have consumers engaging with you across multiple publishers. I mean, if you're a marketer today, there's never been a better time to reach prospects and customers at scale, right? You have tons of platform, tons of devices through which they access you. And I think for a marketer, the challenge is how do you holistically measure this? And then they have to figure out mobile. Yep. So I, I think part of the challenge that uh, marketers are, and CMOs have been asking us, uh, and I think asking and expressing in those polls is um, not only do I grow my ROI, which is always the focus, even if you're building brand, but how do I figure out holistically what the ROI looks like? Uh, so I think part of that is just that. I don't know if you uh, feel the same. It actually takes me to a, the, a, a ne the next question. So I think about um, social in general, and it, it probably is going through the same learning curve that other uh, other technologies went through, other mediums went through. Um, there's, I'm going to use a phrase, and I know it, it's not out there in the public as much as it should be yet, but it probably will be. And, um, but social gets stuck inside social jail, right? It gets stuck inside a place which is, you're the social people, so you should go over there. You're the TV people, you should go over there. But TV, you can come and have a bunch of other conversations with us as well. <laughs> Um, because it's such, a line, it's such a large portion of the spend. So if you think about social jail, social jail is very, it's restrictive, right? So I'll, I'll use an example. In the movie business, an average movie, um, there's 30 million spent on marketing, 17 million spent in media, 4 million of that is spent in digital, half of it goes to Google, 1.7 goes to uh, display, 300,000 of it gets split amongst the social players. 30 million to 300,000, right? And so the, mo the movie business isn't thinking about how do I use social to do other things, drive ticket purchases, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's most obvious that I, Deerj, I probably ask you this question. Sure. Um, how does Facebook? How does Facebook get out of social jail, and how does social get out of social jail? Hey, Deerj, I got a cake for you that I baked. It's got a nice social <laughs> get out of jail like file. <laughs> no problem. Well, it's funny that you, you mentioned about social jail, and we talk about getting into the marketing jail. Uh, I think it's a great, great question. Uh, question for the times. I think it's, it's just a matter of time before it becomes institutional that social, much like search and much like TV, will be a central anchor for driving sales, right? Um, I think the best way to get out of that jail is to have the right conversation, and that's what we begin to have, which is can focus you give, can on... You give, can you give an example? Yeah, so I think um, take, um, take a, a direct response advertiser like lower my bills. Mortgage finance unit wants to drive leads. They've been using Facebook um, to drive leads to an X, I think 2x better conversion rates, 7x better click rates, 16x, 16% um, better LTV of customers they acquired. Okay, that's an example of a direct response advertiser in the financial services industry, um, driving real metrics. Another advertiser is Bud Light. They, um, you know, want to drive in-store traffic and brand awareness, and they've been using Facebook to uh, to do just that. And they're seeing 2x incremental uh, return on ad spend on incre incremental sales and 75% better 
brand lift. Now, th this is just a couple of examples, but I think the, the, the two things, one, you have to have the right conversation with the client. The second, we have to build products for that, right? And so I think one thing we have been very focused on is the end-to-end -end product solution for by objective. Right? So if you're trying to drive online sales, that's a different ball game than if you're trying to build brand, which many of the CMOs are interested in. And um, I think that's how all of us get out of that jail. A, having the right conversation. B, presenting to them the product solution that will solve for that objective. If I, may, if I may jump in, you also have a couple of market driving forces that are changing the I'm stuck in um, social jail, one being the convergence of publishing and commerce, where brands are becoming effectively publishers. When that occurs, social lends itself very, very naturally to pushing content and disseminating it through that channel. So that's a driving force. So it changes force. the content marketing investment. There. Absolutely. Right. And, and it changes the DNA of the brand, because now they have the chief digital officer probably reporting into, um, and the chief um, content officer reporting. There's so reporting, many offices you know, that are going to be inside these companies. Uh, and what they mean is a whole different panel. But fundamentally, when content uh, enters the brand experience, when content, when they become publishers, I think social gets out of jail. The other pieces were... So how, long, how far away are we from that? Well, if you look at the budgets, I mean, social is the fastest growing piece it's still, of but the, It's still minute. But five years ago, digital was minute, and before that, search I was minute. So I, don't say, I don't say it because it's, it's not growing, but I, I take it, so the example I used with the movie business, yep. the movie business spends $30 million per movie, there's 300000 spent on a movie that's in social. I'm pretty sure that it's pr quite easy to attach a thing that's happening in social to you should buy a ticket. I think the piece that's been missing for social jail that we haven't spoken about is the consumer, right? That's why social is relevant, is because people are there. Mm -hmm. And when you look at consumers, consumers have changed, and that's what makes social relevant, and that's going to, at the end of the day, pull it out of social jail. Is we start looking at consumers and, and the way that they behave now, as it used to be the superlative campaigns won, right? Ours is bigger, faster, stronger, cheaper, whatever it was, that advertising message out in the market, we would go and we would consume. Now that's different. We don't trust those brand messages. Mm -hmm. And we trust messages from our friends, from our connections. That's the piece that makes social relevant for direct response, for brand advertising, whatever it is, is that the consumer at the end of the day requires a socially relevant message to actually trust the ad content at all. And as that shift in consumer behavior continues to happen, uh, that's going to be, I think, what takes us out of social jail. And to answer your question, we're probably in the next two to three years, we're going to see social we'll see a very steep slope. The inmates are revolting, man. <laughs> they're revolting. They're revolting. They're, I don't, I, they're, 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 they're pushing back and they're saying, hey, I spend 6.5 hours a day on social. That's how I communicate with my friends and family. You guys have to react to me. And not only people outside of the company, <clears throat> it's people inside the company as well. I mean, it is a thing. Millennials are people. They're communicating differently. I don't even understand. Well, I don't think, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that social jail is, a th is something to do, anything to do with the consumer. Right. I'm saying social jail is to do with how you make, how do, how does, how do marketers, the CMO, think about social as a key driving force of my decision that I'm about to make about a hundred million dollars in spend versus it's three hundred thousand dollars. Well let's put it this way if CMOs don't find a way to crack their communication the outreach to Millennials who will soon have spending power who will soon start earning they will be out of jobs. Mm -hmm. I would so, say, go, go back to basics. Like, why did we get on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube at the very beginning? Consumers were there, A. But B, it was free, right? Ever remember the glory days of everything was free? That's kind of changed now. Things are IPOing. We're experiencing that today. Uh, but as there's still that core benefit of that free aspect to social media. And if we can tap into and remember the core value of social and play into its strengths, when people engage with your advertising, with your content on social, that's free ads. When I share it with my friends, when I like it, when I comment plus one it, whatever it is, you're getting free ad impressions that are more valuable because they have that social context. I think the more we start to understand that and continue to play into social strengths, the better for all of us. So one of the things that, that lends itself to then, so the way you get out of social jail is to never get in it, right? Which is, <laughs> if social is at the beginning of it, so, so I'm, I don't want to use the word social as in we're going to go do something in social, but if we think about the uh, things we're about to do as a marketer, right? I'm going to go and I have this launch of this new vehicle, right? Um, we had Cheryl Connolly here this morning from Ford. Ford. So I'm going to launch this new vehicle. At the beginning, we should be thinking about social not as an appendage, 
Because today it feels like it's very much thought of as an appendage. Like when someone come, when a brand is coming to you, are you before the brief, after the brief, after the agency, after the social agency gets hold of it? Like, wh how do you get to the beginning of the path? Uh, so I'm allowed to talk about my company. <laughs> I'm asking about you. Sure. Yeah. You, okay. Just you have to check. I didn't want to get it wrong. <laughs> uh, we have a freemium business model, so that we're there at the very beginning. As soon as you're a professional that has higher needs than a regular social consumer. So you're before the brief, you're saying? Oh, yeah. So the brief isn't issued. We're well, going to launch a vehicle. We, we, we don't even know what the strategy is for well, our vehicle. You're, already, be, you're at the table? Again, so we already have been working with the social media managers ahead of time. They've been using our software. We've been no, no, I'm them. launching a vehicle. I'm the CMO. Sure. I'm launching a vehicle. I have no idea what my positioning is on this vehicle. Right. Are you at the table, or are you at the table after that's... That's where we rely on our agency partners sorry, sorry. to bring us into those conversations the, for us specifically. Then, sorry, go ahead. No, no it's okay. Uh, the best way to get to the table, the, the front of the table, or the, or the adult table, as they say, uh, is to deliver our wife. You deliver it once, and then you deliver it second time, and boy, third time they will ask you. And that's how paid search was built, that's how TV was built, right? Um, I think your question, though, is a fair one. I think... Uh, how soon will we get there? So what we're observing is, in many categories, we're already there with many advertisers. Mm -hmm. um, for us, telecom, financial services, travel, uh, I mean, we're already there. Um, maybe not everybody knows about it, um, but in other categories, I think we're doing the hard work of getting there. Mainly so I think the, next year... Mainly in direct response categories that have adopted early. Uh, well, gosh, you know, um, direct response, and this has been uh, one of the misperceptions um, in the industry probably two years ago, and to an extent exists, that, well, social is not a place where you generate a direct response. Um, I think that's uh, not true. We have one of the best performing uh, channels for direct generating immediate response at a cost which is very efficient, which is two things yeah. that are important to them. I think one thing that we're thinking about is why is it that social works? I think that's, that's another, you know, we talk about a lot of things about social in different ways. Uh, I think one of the fundamental things is targeting. Um, one, of the, one of the unique things about social is because of the, the intersection of the, um, what people express about themselves and the conversation they're having, you're really talking about authentic targeting on the platform based on identity. And that has some profound implications. You can target more precisely. Uh, you can actually measure holistically. Because now you have a measurement capability which is based on identity mm -hmm. as opposed to a cookie, right? So those are some profound things that um, make this channel today, and I think in future in particular, um, probably one of the most sophisticated channels for marketing. Google, but so if Google, I imagine... Real quick, so Google gets a seat at the table at the adult table, I think yep, is the word you the use. Adult <laughs> Google gets a seat at the adult table when it comes to search because they can deliver killer intelligence to the CMO, right? The stuff that they can deliver uh, across their platform is amazing on search data. And so how do we, how do, how do you, so you can talk about your company again. If you okay, want. thanks. Um, Free pass. Good <laughs> <laughs> <Good> tweet. <laughs> <laughs> I give these guys a lecture. I'm not talking about that company before we started. So, um, but how do you go? How do you how do you get a seat at that table? Which is like, you know, when again when it was so Yahoo used to walk in in the movie business. Google now walks in in search and says we have these killer in, this killer insight about your business CMO of auto company, and they're like this is a killer insight, and they're like we should spend more money here. Right. How, where so they, those things seem to be so so the question so how, you know. Uh, Google has the mind share. How is this thing going to grow? How is this thing going to yeah. play out? And I think that, again, you're seeing uh, that switch from people finding content through actively searching mm -hmm. to their connections on these networks they're spending so much time on. So there's that quality. Um, there's also this whole idea of uh, the direct response opportunity is huge right now. But then these great data plays that are happening with Twitter and Comcast, even, you know, uh, lots of R&D is putting in here to be able to see that lift that you talked about earlier and being able to make those ties together. It's kind of almost unfair that in timing th way it wise, how social came into existence. You know, it got compared against such a great direct response engine as Google AdWords. And so we needed to develop technology to at least get on par there and sometimes exceed that. But really the opportunity is beyond this online compartment we're in, even though it's pretty big, it's 117 billion bucks, 
you're seeing how Twitter is saying, I'm a multiplier mm -hmm. for television. Mm -hmm. And that plays well in the CMO, CEO level. I think that the thing that I've talked to a few clients of ours this week, and um, the thing is, you know, I've talked to the, the decision makers and I've talked to the practitioners. And the decision makers love that story. The practitioners are waiting for that data. I think if we're going to talk about Google, I've got to jump in. And, you know, I think... If we're, if we're looking at, at AdWords, Jeff, you've already right? had one, one flag. <laughs> I, think you I, I will not talk about it spa just <laughs> somehow. Uh, the, I think they're just different. I think that's what it comes down to is whether you could still talk about the direct response world and talk about Facebook versus Google success and direct response. And there's a lot of innovation happening inside of Facebook and Twitter and these social networks to really attack that. But at the end of the day, I, I don't think it's a fair comparison to say that what we need to do is develop technology that is just like AdWords. I don't think that would be the goal for social networks is to develop something that, that fills that exact same gap. I think it's about figuring out how these play together and how these work together because social is all over the funnel. Uh, people are going to their friends. They're looking for in, uh, engagements, recommendations, things like that all over the funnel. I think social's place. Uh, is, is a very large one, and I think that it, it really isn't that we should be focused on that com competition or anything. It's more about how all these products play together to attack that entire funnel and, and get what we're looking for out of advertisers, and from a consumer perspective, get the most value out of our time on digital. How much of that challenge, though, is we're trying to make ourselves different, and reality is different always means I've got to stay at work five minutes later, and so... Most people, most people generally are like, oh, how do I get out of work five minutes earlier, right? That's kind of the, some, some of the mantra. So if we try to make ourselves different, it's just hard to consume. Um, so how, is it the, should we be trying to attach it to something they already know versus trying to say, oh, it is so much different than what you know today? I think you're still attaching it to the same things at the end of the funnel. I think it's just how that interplay happens is different than something in search uh, or something in, you know, social just looks different. Uh, it, people... So I want, to, I want to switch topics. I want to ask a Rudina a question. Um, so when you think about... Um, uh, brands. Brands are testing many things and um, doing things very early. Um, there are many brands that are now thinking about entrepreneurs in residence. Yep. And they're thinking about how they do some of this stuff themselves because they feel as though they have fallen behind because they may have outsourced it to someone, they may have insourced it, they may, a whole bunch of things. So what is your perspective on brands somewhat starting to look like mini venture capitalists? Um, fair question. I think um, the, the trend of having what I would call strategic funds or what you're referring to as mini capitalists comes and goes. There have been brands that financially... I love the phrase mini capitalists, by the way, versus mini venture capitalists. <laughs> um, comes and goes. I think we're at a phase where a lot of brands are feeling that they're not innovating fast enough, so they're creating these separate groups, allocating dollars, small dollars, and then I think that's Achilles' heel, um, to basically try to incubate the things in-house, and we were seeing that across the board, whether it is in the auto space, whether it is in the financial institutions, whether it is in digital media and brands. I think the trick there is that you need a certain amount of capital to rise to the top because we've been talking about how large the opportunity in social is and within the CMO world. Guess what? A lot of entrepreneurs are starting companies in the space. So to be able to rise to the top, not only do you need to differ be differentiated by in the technology, not only do you need to have a very strong execution team that knows how to get that first meeting, that knows knows to make the case to the CMO as to why they should take uh, the huge risk that they're taking, but they should also be well capitalized. And to be inside a strategic fund, unless they have several hundred million to invest and behave like venture capitalists, which is to say to separate their interests, their uh, corporate interests from the behavior of the companies they incubate, that is a, actually a dangerous path, doesn't always pan out. There are venture funds within um, corporations that behave that way and have been successful. That's interesting. So we're talking about money. So um, I, um, this is a question for Jeff and Greg, and either of you can jump in as you, as you choose. Um, the, you have a dollar to spend, where are you going to spend it? Do, uh, do, do, do. <laughs> I'd, I'd buy my CEO a cup of coffee and nice. sit down with them and make sure they had a Twitter account, a Facebook account, a LinkedIn account, and that they understood the communication channel. Because we kind of parse off, you know, social jail, right? Since, 
it feels so alien to be able to publish something that everyone's going to read to a large number of people here. Um, and we kind of talk about it as a completely separate thing from email and phone calls and face-to-face -face meetings. But the thing that socials, the job that uh, socials is going to help your CEO do is not a new job. It's to connect with stakeholders, it's to connect with clients and internal employees and potential uh, customers and develop a relationship. And you're coming to them and chatting with them on the channels that matter to them. You know, you have to be reactive. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's important that the leaders at our organizations, we're talking about CMOs and I'm going CEO on this, you know, this is not a weird alien thing. It's just the same thing as email, same thing as a face-to-face. -face. It's a communication channel to build relationships with people. And as with any channel, there you can do it organically. For most channels, you can do it organically, or you can pay a little bit of extra money, and he's got some ideas on how you can amplify the success that you see from uh, building those relationships. Gary's just wants the money. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a very holistic. So, guy. Jeff, I'm going to go a little more focused on the uh, question. You have a dollar to spend. Are you going to spend it on Twitter or Facebook? Yeah, I think from a marketer's perspective, mm -hmm. I think it's a... It's a good question, and uh, I mean, where I'm coming from, and I know I'm not allowed to talk about exactly what Wildfire does, but I would split the dollar and look at what the objective is, of my campaign is. Uh, and it's not that certain things are good at, at, at certain other things, but essentially there's different tools on these platforms, and I think it's about the interplay of getting those to work well. So we talk about orchestrated marketing. How do you leverage the key strengths of each social network of search and display and sort of orchestrate your marketing approach to play into the strengths of each of those different pieces and make sure that you're getting the biggest bang for your buck? I think if you take a dollar and you spend it all on one platform, regardless of the platform, you're probably not getting the biggest bang for your buck. Interesting. Surprised, Dan, you didn't ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to spend it on your own platform, <laughs> and you're going to invest it in a company. But so then that's it, like, it begs the billboards. question, which company? And <laughs> he loves billboards. <laughs> <laughs> it begs the question, wow. which, which company? And in this day and age, uh, I think there are too many point solutions. We haven't touched on that at all. So we've talked about the platforms, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, G+, which you haven't even mentioned. Um, so uh, we've touched on that piece, and we've touched on the traditional channels and digital channels. What we have not touched is on how we communicate. You have the publishing piece that's generally sitting separately from the dollars, from the paid piece mm -hmm. that's sitting separately from the analytics. And honestly, how many solutions can a CMO digest in one given year? How many integrations? It's time. So if you were to ask me the question, where would I spend my dollars and where have I spent my dollars? horizontal platforms of tools. Mm -hmm. Place that come in and give the CMO as close as possible the ability to do it all in one stop shop, publishing, earned, analytics, listening, all in one stop shop to be able to reinforce off of each other and honestly be able to easily integrate with the traditional um, CRM solutions. Because at the end of the day, in my thesis, I don't think social stands alone. I think social gets integrated into a big CRM play. Right. It's interesting. So um, there's a billion people on, fa on Facebook, a billion plus people on Facebook. There's roughly, what, 500 million tweets that happen every day. Um, and Google owns, I think, 8 billion things that help inform what they have um, as far as indicators. So if Facebook owns the social graph, if Twitter owns the interest graph, and if Google owns the knowledge graph, what is the concern or what is your perspective on Amazon, which arguably owns all three? <laughs> Wild card. Booyah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's intriguing. I really think about what you're talking about here. You can boil down, obviously there's these, these networks are whole entities and there's lots of ways to look at them. But as an advertiser, you should really look at the data they have. And the advertisements that you're going to put on those platforms are only going to be as good as they can be targeted. And so all those qualities that you talked about are intriguing. You threw Amazon out there. I'm doing a lot of thinking about Pinterest even mm -hmm. in, 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 in right. Instagram and thinking about the quality of the data that Pinterest is collecting on people, what they have and what they aspire to be. Is that going to be a better indicator for what Greg Gunn's going to purchase than the friends that he has on Facebook or the things that he likes on Facebook? Not that that's not bad, but like you want to compare these things as an advertiser. Amazon, that's intriguing to me. I haven't actually spent too much time thinking about Amazon other than the fact that they've got the ultimate um, history of what you actually have purchased and what you have looked at. Um, it would be great at some time if advertisers can combine all these social graphs together. 
I'm not optimistic about that because that's kind of the secret sauce of everyone's platform and f fiefdom that they're building right now. You know, one, one would argue that, that that is what Amazon has, right? right. The combination of all of them together. It has, yeah, but in terms of the time on site, that, that's, that's something that they don't uh, compete as strongly in. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I'm not sure that the graphs, which is there's a lot of buzzwords in this question, but the, that the different graphs fit so discreetly I inside think I just of got each of the yellow card. Just <laughs> <here>. <laughs> fit discreetly inside of each of the companies. I think that uh, Google has a lot of different pieces of the interest graph, uh, the social graph. So I think that we're making strides in each of these different areas. That said, in terms of these interplay between the graphs, sort of element to this question. Technology, you're right, is developing in a way, t moving towards getting all of this information into one place. But the great news for marketers, I think, is that you don't have to wait for technology to build those tools for you. Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely possible to use the lessons and the data that you do get from ad campaigns or whatever it might be, different marketing efforts on these different platforms. How can what's performing best in search inform your next Facebook ad campaign or vice versa? How can you use some of the interests and information that first party data coming from Facebook to then turn on a new cookie basket uh, or cookie profile for your display campaign? How can you leverage these different sets of data, which right now, you're right, sort of programmatically from a technology perspective, aren't coming together in some beautiful one pager, but that's sort of where we're headed. And I think from a marketer perspective, the good news is you don't have to wait for that to happen. Interesting. Anyone else? No? Silence? Well, I, I would agree. I think the notion that we own any of us, any graphs, is, is um, not, a, uh, not the right one. Um, none of us owns the consumer. Um, they go, uh, and that's sort of the challenge for the marketer, right? They go everywhere. Um, and, you know, you, you have to, uh, I think all CMOs look at their marketing plan in the context of I have to drive sales, and part of that is build awareness, build consideration, and capture that demand. Um, and how do I do it across the platform? And what platform is really delivering value? Um, we recently launched um, a capability called outcome ma matching or outcome measurement in telecom because we have immense amount of information about uh, people's behavior on the phone because we have half a billion users using mobile phone. And one of the interesting things we found is that um, Ninety percent, I believe, of all sales that came because we can contract from exposure to the sale, whether it happens online, offline, anywhere. Ninety percent of the exposures that came, you know, the sales came had the, the the consumer never clicked on the ad. Okay, so one of the uh, classic issues we're dealing with in the industry today uh, is is this last click model of attributing sales, which is uh, which is a very myopic way of looking. Not that the click is, doesn't matter, but it's a very myopic way of looking the total impact of advertising. Um, I think when we get in a wall of attribution, um, which we are very um, be big believers of, um, then I think we'll get to understand better the consumer behavior across multiple channels, attribute appropriately, invest appropriately. I think that's um, that I think is a big thing that needs to happen in the industry over a couple of years. Okay. Um, so, Greg, uh, you had brought up uh, Pinterest. Yeah, I did. So, <laughs> true. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Is that a challenge? <laughs> um, so, how should how should how should CMOs or how should marketers be thinking about? Both Pinterest and Instagram. It's a, it's a, it's another thing to add, right? CMOs are struggling with, marketers are struggling with the plus one. Everything is a plus one. Yeah. Search is a plus one. Mo mobile is a plus one. Social is a plus one. More people is a plus one. Less agencies changing. It. It's all plus ones. So right. you've just, we've added more to the pile. Yeah. How should we be making sense of it? Well, we could dissect all the individual um, tactics and issues with, or or the things you should implement at these different platforms, but. Overall, we should get pretty used to things changing all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, our thesis that seems to be proving true is that um, social media networks are going to become more fragmented. It doesn't mean that they're going to minimize. They're going to continue to grow really strongly. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be different use cases for all these, the, the, these networks, and they've got a different place in your li life at a different time. And so we should get used to this velocity of new networks coming up for different purposes and build a advertising, marketing team that's as, as dynamic as the uh, communication channels that are, that are popping up. I mean, um, 
the number one thing. Uh, I was just at a CMO dinner last night. And it's go on Pinterest, use it, use Instagram. And like, these are very core things because if you don't actually know how to compose a tweet, you're going to be terrible at promoted tweets. And I, the same thing is with LinkedIn and Facebook. And you need to know how to communicate on these, these, these platforms. If you're writing an email on a Facebook post without a picture, that's going to be terrible. It's going to be terrible for you. It's going to be terrible for the brand. It's true. So you need to be able to really understand these different channels and the qualities of them. It's, they're, they're not going away. You don't need to be on every single one of them. They don't need to eat away your entire television or, or radio budget. They can amplify it. And uh, make sure you hire... Uh, if, you, if you're not into this stuff, you know, make sure you hire people that are passionate about this. Because um, if you're not passionate about social uh, and you're a CMO, you're in trouble. Rudy, I'm sure you've seen companies like Pinterest and uh, Instagram, and you see them. Uh, so, w what's the? You talk about there's going to be more and more of these. So, what are some of the more and more as you think about it? More from not less about company names, but more about kind of some of the trends that you see happening. Sure. So, um, it's interesting because what Instagram and what Pinterest shows us is the evolution from text to images and then video. So, I think we all. I'd be shocked if there was one person here with a flip phone. We all have. A Does smartphone. anyone here have a flip phone? There's three people in the... No, just kidding. <laughs> I win. You're wrong. No, no. <laughs> so um, so I, think, I think it's an evolution of consumer behavior. And so, again, where consumers are um, is where marketers will go. But to your overall question, I think the next frontier for disruption is TV, where technology has not penetrated the market as much as in other areas. So I think the emergence of social TV and ability to finally track and, you know, not just engagement, but basically ultimately all the way to the ROI, ultimately all, all the way to the lift in sales. I think that's a new frontier. Marketers are very focused on native advertising and you will see, I see a lot of startup activity in that area. And uh, also, you know, the, as I said earlier, the convergence of content and publish and um, commerce. So how can you crowdsource content at a, in a scalable manner that is not a core expertise of brands, at least not to date? So I think um, CMOs are drinking from a fire hose. Think about having to become technologists. Think about having to own content in the you know, magazine publishing type fashion. And then also keeping up with all the startups that are pitching them. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how many startups pitch a CMO or, or the CMO organization on any given day? How do you know to make that judgment call. Greg, hey, Greg, you have something else? Yeah, I, I do. I, I just do. saw your hand up. Well, I mean, it's interesting because we kind of frame this stuff as uh, we have these pillars of yeah. marketing, right? Like yeah. we have television, advertising, we have print, we have these things, and how, what's going on with this social yeah. thing, and how do I put this into these frameworks that I have right now? But if you don't think that these things are going to be affected by social technologies, that's a bad start. I mean, what happens when or if Netflix starts showing new movies 30 days after they release? Suddenly, you have a great DR opportunity that is competing with television and radio. You know, uh, what happens when we start seeing maybe new episodes being of, of, of television shows being aired on Facebook? Mm -hmm. You know, um, but Greg. How do you know that TV has an impact? You need technology to come in and try to measure. Instead of just saying, I think I see a lift in my track. Here's how it's measured today, right? Advertisers, uh, you see an ad on TV, they see behavior online, right? right? I see a spike, and I try to correlate. And what Nielsen gives me is a very bad estimate at base, especially relative oh, to the I data. Oh, I love a good Nielsen bashing. Uh, <laughs> well, that's been traditional, especially relative to the data that they're getting from the, gra from the social graphs and the analytics that they're getting from search engines and whatnot. So you need the penetration of technology to be able to actually measure impact. To be, to be fair, TV, TV works. I mean, TV is, is proven to work, and that's why Time Warner is posting such great numbers from their earnings call. Um, and continues to grow, advertisers continue to invest in it. I mean, this is a, a very rich media way, and the social network I think that we haven't spoken a lot about, but it's very relevant when you talk about TV, is, is YouTube. And you think about the changing consumer and how people no longer want to passively consume content, but actually want to engage with content, when you think about those rich media opportunities for advertisers... But you just made my point, because you're able to track behavior on YouTube, you're able to target on TV. Traditionally, you have not. And yeah, this versus now... Blunt, blunt measures are what exists today, exactly. right? So I, I don't think your point was TV doesn't work. I think the blunt measure that exists today, which is 
the company you, that you mentioned yes. that we won't <laughs> talk about. Um, no, but it's, it's, a, it's a blunt measure, right? So yeah. it, it, if, as a marketer, if I'm given blunt measures, it's hard to react. It's hard to, and if it arrives a month later, three months later, it's like, okay, yeah, we think this happened, and oh, by the way, my sales data is already back. Now let me go and look back to TV. I think that's one of the advantages of social data, right? So social information allows us to get to a place where the actual data that's being created in the way that Google was able to do for search, it's creating a rich set of information that has arguably never existed before. And so taking advantage yeah. of that is, a, is, a, is, is a, a quite a huge thing. So we're running uh, short on time, and I'm going to go to some questions um, on the phone. Um, Caller? <laughs> oh. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> um, where are you calling from? Uh, <laughs> this is a, a, interesting. I think we may have answered this question, but we, we can probably re revisit it. How do, social, how, do so, how do social platforms play together to really impact the purchase funnel? So I can give an, uh, so maybe stage an wise, So I think stage-wise. Cold like, Yes. Yeah, so doesn't have to pass the test. <laughs> a quick example, I think, um, uh, for somebody using multiple social networks and in a marketing campaign is actually Aeropostal was using both YouTube and Facebook together to actually get sort of video consumption for sort of a new brand, a fresh feel for Aeropostal, targeting their sort of young uh, teenage sort of consumer. And what so they were doing... You can put your answer in context of awareness, uh, consideration, and actually the transaction. So if we think about laying the social platforms alongside that, which, I think the question is which platform is good for which aspect of the funnel? So I think the answer there is that they don't fit nicely into one piece of the funnel or another. I think you would have to talk about more capabilities with each of these networks and where would you place a targeting type or an ad type maybe. So something like a custom audience targeting and conversion a sort of optimization on Facebook would maybe be towards the bottom of the funnel. Uh, with YouTube, you know, you obviously have sort of the, the pre-roll sort of ad ads that come before videos play, and maybe those are more sort of top of funnel awareness type ads, but there's elements to each of these different networks, and I think there's strengths for Facebook, for YouTube, for Google+, for whatever it is, that fit into each of the portions of the funnel, not that Facebook is top of funnel and YouTube is bottom of funnel, but each of these different sections. And just to echo that, because and I will not mention the company name, but I have made a bet on a company that tries to basically enable brands to identify individuals across channels. I think um, Diraj touched on it earlier, the loyalty programs, multi-channel approaches that tie in the behavior of an individual and identifying the individual. Most marketers do not know that the individual with a shortened Twitter, um, my Twitter ID is, or handle is Rudina11. They do not know that I am the same person as Rudina Cesare on Facebook, as the person who just spent this amount of dollars on that brand, as the one who made the purchase over mobile. The, all the social channels, the ability to leverage that data across channel and, and know who that individual is actually enables them to better target that individual. And the way that they get the data, some of it they get it from first party, some of it they get it from opt-ins for loyalty programs and other multi-channel plays. So I'm going to, um, so, if, so great that it can be used for the funnel. So let's go to one other, another big cost that exists uh, within the marketer's uh, ecosystem. So anywhere from... 15% to 25, 30% of the marketing fund is non-working dollars, right? It doesn't go into advertising, it doesn't go to any of you guys. It doesn't certainly go to you, but it doesn't go to you guys, right? So how can you affect that number? How can you help decrease that number? Because that is the most, it's things like copy testing, it's things it's like ad testing, it's things like building the spot itself. It's like there's a whole bunch of costs. We talk about $500 billion of uh, money spent a year. It's a big number. It's bigger than the size that's spent on digital. So how do you affect that number? How does, how does social advertising, how does, how does it help me solve for that problem? So social media decentralized publishing. I think we know that now. Yep. Um, something that I think we'll be talking about in the next couple of years about how social media advertising is going to decentralize ad spend. And you know, there's things out there in the li live right now like LinkedIn mail. What's the difference between me paying five bucks to get my LinkedIn mail to you versus me paying Google five bucks to get my message in front of you when you're surfing the web? Mm -hmm. And again, this is, there's a certain authenticity that social brings in that you have to use it to build relationships and conversations with people, mm -hmm. and then you have this opportunity to amplify it. And so we're kind of moving away from this whole model of let's 
test and copy and see what resonates with our users and let's be a little bit, let's, let, let's share more with our users and see what actually works in, a, in an organic way. And then you kind of start getting rid of this whole like, let's go into our garage and figure out the perfect marketing scheme. And you can actually do it a little bit more reactively in real time. So does that say social allows us to get away from cold starts when we start actually getting to hot starts? Because we actually I, understand I'm not familiar with that, that. So if a, cold, if a cold start is, I know nothing about my customer, let me go throw a bunch of uh, small amounts of information. In the, this is how advertising yeah. works today, right? Small amounts, of, uh, small amounts of dollars into the market to right. test which ones work. These ones work really well. I'm now going to put truckloads of money behind them, right? So that's a cold start. Hot start is, I know so much about my customer now that I don't have to worry that it's not going to work. Right. So the testing model changes. Um, I think that... Previously, we've looked to scale things out, and we've had to compartmentalize things almost in terms of a uh, forward assembly line in terms of how we do advertising. And uh, right now, we're we're, we're 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 breaking down these barriers, and it's right. a lot more personalized. And people are organically communi communicating with people. You know, we're starting to do more of an ads effort. Personally, my company, and we're not just assuming that all eight million users will just start using our ads because we put it into our tool. We're sitting down and talking to them. It's the same way that when we launched the company, you go and talk to somebody and you work with them and you listen to them and you have an organic connection with them rather than just trying to put them into a, a compartmentalize and say, this is the, uh, the demo that we're going after. And also, and also sorry, think oh. the, sorry, Rudine, the, the non, what we, what we call non-working funds will begin to shift into areas which are more efficient and deliver a higher ROI. So the two, first of all, doing testing and copy optimization, especially in platforms, whether it's search or social, is really easy. That's one of the power of that. I think the areas where we will invest more in marketers already is data, right? So as I was alluding to earlier, because now you have so much data, you have much more precise targeting. Um, you know, on, on Facebook and other platforms, you can now reach prospect and customers separately. It's a much more personalized targeting and messaging model. So now you're going to get much more efficient and sophisticated in how you target and how you message. So you'll see marketers spending more money on advanced capabilities, ad tech, which is this conference about, a lot of ad tech capabilities, uh, to be able to do this at scale. Uh, and to be, rather than a TV spot, which is one message for five weeks, you have to micro-segment because you have that power, and that generates better ROI. So you'll see that shift in investment on those, those sides, uh, as opposed to doing stuff which will go away and is already going away, where you can do very rapid optimization. In uh, fact, platforms. if you look at, you quoted the overall dollars are split between non-working and working, but if you look at within social, non-working dollars are 60% of the social budget. So software is making its way into the non-working dollars and shifting the traditional, and for TV, I think it's 1090, right? So it's completely shifting the landscape. And honestly, who cares if you take dollars from the non-working versus the working budget? If you're coming as a platform software solution play at tech, and you're taking dollars from the non-working, and then you're driving a 4x, 5x um, return on that one dollar that got spent out of the working dollars, take a piece of the pie from both. I I'm think going to tweet that stat, by the way. I learned that from you today. I'm going yep, to tweet that. That's uh, really interesting. In fact, it is. If you or really, Facebook it if you really care, it's, 10, um, it's <laughs> 1090 for TV, it's 2080 for the search, and it's 6040 for social. And I think this is because Put it's on a t-shirt. Okay. It's hard for <laughs> brands, right? It, it, because it's so decentralized, when you learn that you want to promote something, a tweet, a, a message, whatever it might be, the chain of people that you have to get up to whoever might actually hold the ad dollars to promote that in a lot of brands and a lot of agencies is quite a few people because social straddles so many different pieces of this ecosystem. So I think what it comes down to is more organizational changes and empowering social, giving them a seat at the table, getting them on that adult, adult table. That's what's going to help make this more efficient is if we can sort of streamline some of those just points of communication. Yeah, I think the, uh, so the organizational stuff we're going to have to go after on a, on a different panel. But I'm going to go down the line. I know we're out of time, so we're 30 seconds each. But so when we started, we talked about knowledge today is going to help prevent chaos in the future. So what are you most excited about for the future? So what I'm most excited about, I think, is, is finally contextualizing what social is doing. You know, we, 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 we've been thinking a lot about social in sort of its individual silo. And I think what's really exciting for marketers and for all of us as we continue is starting to understand how social is contributing to your other marketing initiatives, how it works on and offline, and actually starting to see it 
get that uh, get that place at the table through technology and through just its sort of continued growth in the industry is we're really going to start to understand exactly what's going on, where does social play into the funnel, uh, and there's some exciting things going on at, at Wildfire by Google to, to help kind of share that. <laughs> can I get a little pitch in at the end? Is yeah, that allowed? You, you can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Go ahead. I think the ability for marketers to understand intent, the intent of consumers at a very granular level, and to do so in real time. That's great. Uh, I touched on a little bit. I'm excited about the decentralization of advertising spend. I think that we think about marketers as being the people in, they're great at it, but the people that are responsible for getting the message out. You've got a lot other of, of other employees in the company, internally sales, HR, support, that can help do the same job, and uh, they just need to be coordinated. Great. Well, we are most excited about really building and Sorry, when you say we, is that the royal we? <laughs> is it, uh, is, it is the, the we as in Facebook we. <laughs> How, what uh, are you excited about, dear? Us, well, what is, us on well, the couch. Well, on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I personally, listen, you know, inside the company, I'm most excited about that part of what we're working yeah. on, which is uh, building end-to-end -end solution by objective. I think it's been a paradigm shift in our company in really thinking that way. Um, and really trying to figure out a couple of big problems. Um, you know, targeting getting much better targeting, figuring out mobile. Uh, we're, we're already halfway there. And, and holistically measuring ROI for our, for our markers. I mean, those, are the, those are the most exciting problems. That's great. On. Well, Deerage, Greg, Rodina, Jeff, thank you for your time. And uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation some other day. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so before, um, before everyone, uh, everyone leaves, um, I have a, one quick reminder. The uh, Startup Spotlight series starts at 1 p.m. on the expo floor. Uh, Torneau is going to be giving the, uh, doing a, uh, having four companies pitch them. These are four really exciting companies. So you can find it on Innovation Alley. Okay? Thanks very much. Hey, good job. Man.